Welcome everybody then to the very first session, our first guest of the School of Calisthenics podcast live. And if you've got any questions for uh, Brian Keane, who is going to be the first guest, then uh, put them in the comments below. I'm going to get him on now. Oh. Here he is. Bye, man. How are you, Jago? Mate, absolutely uh, buzzing. Uh, for this and for you to kick things off for us. We've got a lot of people signing in, um, saying hello and waving hello. I'm going to try and do a decent job of uh, keeping an eye on comments for questions. The yes. idea about the podcast live is that we want as much interaction with and give people the chance to, to bring the podcast to life. So if people have got specific questions for Brian, put them in the comments and we will try and get through obviously as many of those um, as possible. When we do the podcast itself, obviously that is a, a, an interview and a conversation with the guests, but we don't get to, or the listeners don't get to see us and uh, they don't get to ask you um, those questions on the hoof or on the fly, but um, that's the opportunity for people today. So in fact, Brian, firstly, thank you for joining us. Man, my pleasure. All I, I was listening to you and Tim there earlier before you came on. I'm like, oh, my background is so boring compared to yours. Nice. I'm like, you've got this beautiful caricature in the background and then Tim's got this little magic thing going on in the background. I'm like, oh, man, my books are so boring. <laughs> yeah, but, um, so the, the one, one shout out to do is um, Red Light Rising. They, they um, sponsor our podcast and they're sponsoring the, the podcast live event today. So that red light that was in the corner, that's Red Light Therapy. Yes. Um, and those guys are sponsoring the podcast. That, yes. Thank you to them for, for obviously sponsoring making looks. Uh, Bridget Fitz really said, you two look like brothers. Yeah, you've got the memo about the hat. I know, yeah, that's it. The I'm hat, like, and we, we've been talking game. about beards. For those that are yeah, watching, right. I'm like, we've been doing our beard DMs yeah. and going, oh, I had a little shirt. I, I, I tried to tidy up a little bit for you, Brian. <laughs> I didn't. I meant to, and I'm like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I'm like, locked out, I forgot. <laughs> But yes, it's, and so far we're getting comments about the beard rather than this some of the. Uh... <laughs> That's it. It's just the hour of us talking about beards. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to j just firstly then for um, for for just really sort of really really quickly your um, little like your back to very short snippet background of you like um, you know you're, you're an author you've written a few books and you've done some amazing um, challenges and stuff as well. Um, your what, what I wanted to sort of get into a little bit is the mindset stuff and then a little bit around the sort of fitness and nutrition. Um, there's some questions I've got for you uh, personally. But um, yeah, give us a little bit of a background on to just yourself for those listening. Yeah, so just Watch super you. background. Uh, former primary school teacher turned personal trainer, fitness person. Um, and then over the space of oh, the last six years, um, I've gone from being one of those, I'm still one of those selfie Instagram twats, but I'm less of so one of those. Um, you're, you're a TikTok one now. <laughs> I'm a TikTok twat now. I'm like, I'm like all about the shirtless selfies on TikTok. I'm like, let's grow this TikTok. Um, but yeah, so over the last few years, I went from competing in bodybuilding, professional fitness modeling, traveling around into ultra endurance. So now I do things like Marathon to Saab. I ran through the Arctic last year. I ran 100 mile ultra marathon in February. Um, I was training for Ironman triathlon before the lockdown and before everything got canceled. Um, and over the last few years, I moved my business online. And now I work with people to get in shape in either uh, GEA, which is the sports specific in Ireland, health and fitness, normal weight loss, muscle building, um, or consulting people on their fitness business online. And I've over the couple of years, I wrote a few books. Um, yeah, and now I just chill out really and train and work out and like try and do handstand put like stuff when I can I'm like oh I need to do more of what the lads are doing but that's that's another story for another day or I'm like right human flag human flag that's that's what I said I said after the Arctic yeah. I feel so bad like because I said after the Arctic I'm like right human flag I'm like I'm gonna fucking yeah. pick one Tim I'm open I'm allowed to I'm allowed to swear it's Instagram live and that's, yeah <laughs> so I was like Tim and Jack I'm gonna pick the brain of human flag and I'm like I went to this shiny object thing over here and I went to so I'm coming back to it. Yeah, we talked, um, we, you, you, when you were on the podcast, it was before you'd done the Arctic, I think, mm -hmm. and you were gonna, you were gonna come to Nottingham for the event that we were gonna do today. That was yeah. before Corona sort of put that to to bed or, or to made us take it online. And yes, we talked about the human flag. We may, we'll, we will, we will hook that up for sure. We've got. Um, <laughs> You know, Ben Shepard from um, Good Morning TV and Ninja yeah. Warrior. 
yeah, he, yeah. Uh, he came to one of our first, he came to one of our early workshops a couple of years ago and he loves, like with the Ninja Warrior stuff, he loves it. And um, he, he's got handstand and human flag on his radar as well. Right. And I was like, look, we need to, we need to like, we need to like hook these things up and actually one thing would be great would be like showing that sort of journey and doing some, I've done some with Will Greenwood, you know, the um, England rugby, Will Greenwood. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. We're doing some Instagram lives with him and like just doing some like coaching on the hoof, actually. Um, yeah, it's cool for people to see, but also like it's interesting to see that that journey and, and how that goes on. It's, so. such, it's such an ego thing, though, isn't it? I'm like, I'm like, this serves no function in my life. <laughs> like, I run ultra marathons, I do triathlon. I'm like, it serves no purpose. But I'm like, I still want to be able to do it and just be like going up to the side of the bar and just flaking up on the side. So, um, yeah. Well, anyway. But from a, from a mindset perspective, what I want to talk to you, one of the things I want to talk to you about first is um, we've, got, and we've got some questions about ultra running, which is good. But one of the things is that for you to go, right, I'm going to, you've done all these amazing things and then go, right, I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do a human flag. But from a mindset perspective, when you first try and do it, you're going to feel horrible. You're going to feel terrible. You're going to feel weak. It's going to like reduce you to like going from, I'm, I'm, I'm good at training, I'm strong and I can do this. And then you go into this position, it's like, oh man, that feels impossible. If you think of um, Ross Edgeley, we, yes. did, we, did this, like, we, did the, we did a session with him um, and he's a beast. So actually 45 minutes later, he held a human flag for a couple yep, of seconds. No, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> but, when we, but, but, when we, but the first thing we showed him, he was like, man, this is for him. Like, like it reduced him initially until his body figured it out it reduced him to a normal person he was just like me and you <laughs> but then 45 minutes later but that's because he's a, that's because he's a beast yeah, that's um, so yeah. it will it will be good to um we always we talk about it like calisthenics when you test when you try something out that you've never done before it definitely like humbles you yeah. uh, and you learn i think you learn a lot about yourself during those phases of going like I'm going to try this thing that feels impossible, the whole redefining impossible for us, and and go in. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to sort of expose myself to that feeling of weakness. That's not just physical, but it's also mental. Um, and then challenge up, and then and then go through that. So from a you know you've you've done a number of challenges just from this mindset perspective. And um, what were the titles of your um, of your books on mindset? So uh, the fitness mindset was the first one, and then rewire your mindset was the last one, the latest one. That, that rewire your mindset is uh, is all about mindset. Uh, the fitness yeah. mindset, fitness element, obviously, to it as well. Um, but yeah, the rewire your mindset feedback on that one particularly, even though the first book was a multi-time bestseller for, because it just did really well. This yeah. book on a lot deeper, so the people that have read it have been like, oh my god. Um, so the feedback's been incredible. But again, I've lived a lot of it. So I think I, documenting that down in a book has probably been the reason that it's helped people. Yeah, yeah. So from a, um, from a mindset perspective, how would you, like, what's some of the things that you've learned the most from some of those challenges and things that you've done? Um, well, similar to what you there, Jacko, like, it's funny because I see a couple of questions coming in, ultra running questions below, but yeah. like, I, I'm very vocal on my channels how much I hate running. Um, <laughs> like, like, I hate it. I, I don't enjoy it at all. Um, but it's not the reason why I do it. So, like, people that don't, for the, anyone that's on here, I generally don't look like an ultra runner for the most part, you know, and I'm probably putting that lightly in terms how of... How tall like, are you? 5'8". Like, I'm 85. Oh, yeah. And you're... you're he's, yeah, check, yeah. Check I feel, some... feel like a hobbit, like little short <laughs> arms, but like... It's good, you know, stocky, you're like strong. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm like, turn to the side, make yourself a figure, it's fine. Me so more. Look, look tall, wear up platforms. Um, but yeah, so I'm not built like an ultra runner. So I don't find running easy at all. So when even when you're saying about the human flag, I still don't find running easy. Um, as, as, even as I get better with it, it's still not easy. I, partly because I don't enjoy it at all. Um, like I love weight training. I love calisthenic work, body weight work. I love CrossFit workouts. I love anything in that realm, but I don't enjoy running. So what I get so much from either the challenges, and to be honest, Jacko, as big as say Marathon de Saab was, which is six back-to-back -back marathons through the Sahara Desert, self-sufficient for anyone unfamiliar with it, or the Arctic, which was 230 kilometers through the Arctic. They were difficult for obvious reasons, but the training was just as difficult because it's mind-numbing to jump on a treadmill for 30 kilometers on a training day. Like, it just, it, it just 
sucks your soul. Like, yeah. but because of that, you mindset wise and mentally, it makes everything else feel so much easier. And the reason it's funny because the reason I sign up for, say, for example, Marathon to Saw, which is 2018, Arctic, which is 2019, and I ran a 100 mile ultra marathon in February of this year. And the reason I signed up to those three is because I wasn't sure if I could complete all three. Like, they, before I had signed up, I'm like, I don't know if I can run six back-to-back -back marathons. And then I said, I don't know if I can run through the Arctic. And then I had the 100 miler. I'm like, I don't know if I can run 100 mile. It, it took me 26 and a half hours. I was trying to do it in 24. It wasn't going that way when I did it. It was like, right, no, you're not making this in 24. Um, so I probably end up going back and doing a 100 miler and trying to do it in 24 hours. But it was because I have to set a big goal or else I can't get motivated to train. Like, I won't train for a marathon. I won't. Like, I know I can run a marathon. So I won't train for it. So I have to set a goal that scares me a little bit and forces me to train. Because I'm like, well, it, particularly with the Sahara and the Arctic, but this is relative to anybody. I'm like, if I don't train... I could die in these places. You know, I'm not going to die doing 100 miles. Yeah. Ultra but I also had set a goal for myself and I wanted to finish it. So the mindset side of that alone breaks down into everything. Because you're like, well, you set a goal. And what I love about ultra endurance, more so than even when I used to do bodybuilding and sport, is the goal is so big in terms of the, the, the physical distance you have to cover. So for example, six back-to-back -back marathons is 250 kilometers, you know? Yeah. And you have to chunk that down in order to be able to hit that target at all. I'm like, you can't, all right, pyramid of prioritization. I was like, there was no point worrying about running. I, had, by the way, when I signed up for Marathon to I never ran a marathon. I never ran. It was the first marathon I signed up for. Um, so when I started to break it down, I'm like, well, I need to be able to run one marathon. I'm like, if I can't run one, there's no point worrying about six. So it forces you to break down goals into smaller component parts. And what that does is it makes everything else so much easier. So when you're faced with a business goal or a life goal or a relationship goal, it allows you to kind of break it down into smaller component parts and kind of prepare what you need to do right now. It also is really good at making you focus on the present moment. Like, you know, focus, what can I do now that's going to help me hit the same goal? And then you just do that. And you just do that repeatedly until you, you know, whatever target you set for yourself. And it doesn't have to be, you know, we spoke about this the last time I was on. It doesn't have to be Marathon to Saab. That's somebody else's 10K run. Or that's somebody yeah. else's handstand, you know, handstand. Yeah, that's... Or that's, human bag, you know? It, yeah, it's yeah. relative to the person. And I think that is what it gave me. And then all I do then on my channels and my books, etc., is like break that down and show it how it's applicable for, for my audience, which is more weight loss, fat loss, toning up, building muscle, etc. Yeah. Even though I'm a bit of an endurance audience, it's not pure calisthenics it's just people that enjoy fitness and yeah. i'm like it's the same thing the same clues for success are applicable whether you're running six back-to-back -back marathons in the sahara or whether you're trying to do a handstand push-up it's it's the same thing you take the goal and you put it down to the smaller component parts i know you do this really well you know when you're teaching in the school like yeah. it's this is what you need to be able to do in order to do this and it's the exact same thing in any goal you set for yourself. yeah i think that gives you a um what what those what that does is it gives you a process that you can then and a roadmap that you can then follow and that you know that you've got and that gives us confidence to go there. I mean, what you've you've gone through there, I just want to unpack a few of the things you went you went through there and like there's so much there's so much in that. Um and one thing I wanted to say at the start was um I remember we when, the first time we ever met, I was like this guy, like the, the the energy that you bring <laughs> to just like your your life, your day, your just how you, your demeanor, um, yeah, I find infectious, and I, I'm like, with, I'd always, I'd, I'd I'd love to, I'd love like a webcam on you. I want to see what I'm like <laughs> Sunday night at nine o'clock. What are you like? Are you still? Are you? Still I'm in like, bed at Sunday at nine o'clock, Dago. I'm one of those people. I'm like, I'm up at four or five Monday yeah. morning. I'm in bed at nine. So like, <laughs> that'd be the most boring <laughs> webcam of all time. It's like one of those Big Brother green screens on my bed. <laughs> yeah, that makes me feel a little bit. That makes me feel. I'd love to be. Um, I don't know. I guess some people, depending on how much, like. I have, I'm sometimes like super loud, but then other times I'm like, um, but anyway, but um, I've got a question related to that to ask you in, in a second. But um, from that mindset side of things, like I think it, the fact that you said then, it was like your first ever marathon was the first one of the, the, the design. And like you can't, you need to, you need a goal that like scares you a little bit. Like that tells, 
that tells you something about yourself, your personality, your mindset. And I think that by that you've got a very good awareness, like self-awareness of, of what that's like. And therefore you can then choose the right goals and things um, for you. And, you. and you said it very well that like for a lot of people, their goal or their thing that scares them might be just like the first pull up or whatever it might. Or, and, and I like the fact that you talk about um, these things that you learn from a fitness perspective about yourself and your mindset that you can apply them to your business, like you, with you, the stuff you do, or, but that could go into family life or relationship or whatever it may, may be as well. There's so much to be learned from the tool of fitness training, whatever you want to call it, but how that then teaches us stuff about ourselves, our mindset and how we can use that to be positive in lots of other areas um, of our life. I think that that's, that they're, they're such good messages for people to hear time and time and time um, again. And the fact that you're talking about breaking those things down, as I said, like forming that into a place. I think that is, that is a takeaway message, like a little bit of gold that people can, can take straight away. But um, just play devil's advocate on that as well, Jacko, because sometimes when I see that, like, one of the things that normally, yeah, I won't say connects with people, but definitely people know it's similar to what you said there, is that I set goals that are big for myself because it motivates me. Yeah. And the reason I do that is down to a character flaw that I identified. Because when I talk about this in the book, and I talk about this in my podcast, is I regularly signed up for things and then didn't do And I had to use that, well, why was I signing up to this marathon or this show or this thing over here and I wasn't doing it? And what I found was I, unless I got excited or into that point where I was afraid to do something, I wasn't motivated enough to train for it or to do it in general. So that's yeah. actually a character flaw based on I can't sign up for 10K and train for it, get motivated. I struggle with the motivational side if the goal is too small for me. So that's, and everyone falls somewhere different on yeah. that spectrum. So yeah. I never want to hear me and think, oh, I need to set a big, massive goal that I'm afraid of. I'm like, that might work for you, but you might be just as motivated setting a goal that is something you'd like to do. So yeah. everyone falls slightly different on that spectrum. And it's worth knowing that because yeah. I never want people to hear me and go, well, that's what I need to do because you might fall somewhere else on that spectrum. Slightly. Yeah. And me, and, me and Tim had a really good chat. Um, like each, so we tend to do like a bit of a, like what was the, at the end of the year, like a podcast about like goals and that sort of stuff, like what you did, had set for the year or this, that, the other. And there was, it was last year for Tim, he was like, he'd set stuff before that actually was stressing him out when he wasn't achieving them. And it was actually, it was actually being detrimental, but that's just part of that process of going, that's then, I see that as a positive thing. You go, during that, you've learned that this applies to you. And I think that one of the things that people don't do enough is to like sit down like with your notebook, your school card's notebook, but sit down yeah. with, yeah. take some sick. time out of your day <laughs> to like actually self reflect around like what is, what works for you? What things do you like? And what, like you said, what motivates you and what, what doesn't and, use the things trying to uh, i've done a few podcasts recently um where talking about things not necessarily being like good or bad like just going that was an experience what did i learn from it and what did i learn from it about myself and it's not about being um selfish it's like we need to do a little bit of that because if you start to understand yourself better you can apply yourself better in this world then you're going to be more a, a, a better positive effect um on other people um and I, yeah i just think that the in this i it's every you i'm sure you'll be the same i've seen you know every spare minute now you're crushing it on tiktok um, but <laughs> i do i'm slightly addicted to tiktok <laughs> but, it's so, but it's so easy to fill your whole day from 4 a.m when you get up to eight o'clock at night when you go to bed that with we can fill that if we want to constantly with having had zero time spent thinking about how am i doing and that sort of stuff. But anyway, um, so that's just an encouragement to people. I want to, but whilst you were talking about the ultra stuff, I wanted to get, we've got some questions. So George uh, Pittigal, I'm terrible at pronouncing Oh, it. I'm the worst. At, I hate said, like, pronouncing names. I'm like, butcher. I, I'm like, Irish accent is fine. So like. I'll stick with George. I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know George. I think he's, um, he's a member in our uh, virtual classroom. He's got an online membership with us. So 
Um, obviously, we'll ask, we'll answer, we'll ask his question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, there's no prejudice here. So, um, how do, you, how do you combine your training for endurance along with your conditioning weight training work? Is it more about periodizing for certain goals, or do you try to keep on top of all of it? Great question. Great question. Um, it, yeah, it, it's a combination of both. So in when I'm training, I don't. I normally have one or two events that I'll train for per year, and they're like the main focal points of my training. So, for example, prior to COVID, it was the hundred mile in February, and then it was Ironman in June, which was supposed to be the end of this month, um, like next weekend. So that was supposed to be the, the the kind of the split on the training, meaning that all my conditioning and gym work. I, I still do all my normal weight training, all my normal body weight work, all my normal split. And then if I'm training for an event, I just add it on top, which means that I need to get really good at my nutrition and my recovery because my training volume goes way, way up. So, right. so you don't cut back on any of, that, any of your other... Uh, un unless... I'll listen to my body. I'll do it very intuitively. Like if I'm doing, say, like, you know, a, a 100 kilometer a week or 150 kilometer a week where I'm doing a lot of running, and my body's really sore, I'll scale back a little bit just to kind of give myself the time. Um, but no, generally, like, I, I, I do a lot of high-focus runs. So probably one of the mistakes I made for the last 100 miler was I didn't do enough distance. Like, I, for 80 miles, Jacko, I was fucking flying. Like, I, I finished in the top 10 in that race. Um, like, I was, I was flying. Really? Yeah, yeah. So I, I did really well. I hope it can but, run. Yeah, yeah uh, for a while for a while and, well, but also you took twice as many steps as anybody else yeah, but that's it like i'm like <laughs> i'm like this little duh, 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 like on, on my little short legs my little hobbit legs but you see the what happened to me was at 80 miles i was like flying i was perfect at 80 miles how long to, how long was that to 80 miles sorry at to 80 miles roughly in, in terms of the, this in terms of duration well, that, that would be 80 miles. I mean, so, I mean yeah, time duration. Yeah, so the time, uh, what was that 80 miles? I was at, ooh, I was on track to make 24 hours. So it must have been around 20 oh. hours. Um, it must have been around 20 hours. I can't remember it off the top of my head. And but I was stopping <laughs> during that. Uh, is, is uh, so what I did was, uh, so the, 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 the course I did was a 2.2 mile loop. So it was, you just go for 2.2 miles for 100 miles. And I... What I did was every 25 miles, I took a 25 minute break to eat. Um, and then I went again. But you see where I picked up time is on 100 milers, some people will sleep or I, I don't sleep. I'll just keep going straight through. And so that's where I picked up the time. And um, so I was in like 30 place, 30 first or 30 second on mile 50. And then I jumped up to the top 10 from that time because I was just going at the same pace. Right. My mile five pace was the same as my mile 75 pace. But wow. once I hit 80 miles, my body just broke. Like everything, like my knees, my hips, everything. So I think one of the mistakes of my training, to bring it back to the question, was yeah. I did a lot of high focus training. So a lot of 10 kilometer runs, a lot of 20 kilometer runs fast. So I was doing them quickly. So I was quite good up to 80 miles, but then my body just broke. It literally just went, ugh. Like, um, so I think, on feedback from that, if I was preparing for another 100 miler, I would do some more longer runs. I don't like doing junk miles. You know, a lot of ultra marathon runners do a lot of junk miles where they're just, you know, t hit, hitting the miles just to get them done. Oh, so I think, was that junk? Yeah, junk. Uh, J U N K. Like, oh, like junk. Rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, junk miles. Um, yeah, so like junk, junk miles, where I don't do a lot of that. Like I could, I could do a fifty mile week, but it's very high quality. It's interval, it's sprint, it's fast, and that's the way I train. So that's also one of the re reasons I kind of keep a lot of my size. Um, also, my calories go up. Like I'll bump my calories right up if I'm training a lot. So I don't really lose that much size when I'm preparing for an ultra. So how my training will look. Is if I'm training for an ultra, I'm running every training day, and if I'm not, I back right off. Like, uh, well, like in the in the Arctic, I, you know, I was off for six months because I tore my Achilles, so I couldn't run for six months anyway. So, but even structurally, I'll stop running for a month, six weeks after completely. Partly for my head because I hate running and I've done the target and hit the goal, but also for my body, it kind of gives me that periodization of backing off, and then I'll do more strength work and more bodybuilding work that I enjoy or more body weight work that I enjoy. And that just keeps me kind of mentally fresh. Like 
I train because I love it. Um, and then I run because I have an event that I'm training for. So they, it's kind of like trying to find that sweet spot between the two. That's what I do. What I advise isn't always what I do, by the way. So yeah. what I advise to do is similar to what you say. You know, it depends on the person. What's your strategy? Yeah. What's your goal? What do you enjoy? But that's what I do personally. Yeah, you've worked, you've, it goes back to that same point. It's a really nice point to, to come back to. You've worked out what works for you, both physically, but also there, both, and mentally, like it's what you like and what keeps you fresh and what you can manage. But at the same time, you're being sensible in that you said that you, you do listen to your body and listening to your body may be changing the amount of volume that you do and tweaking that week and also changing your nutritional strategy so that you are fueling for that. So rather than just going more, like, because those junk miles, like more is not always more. No. <laughs> just, really? um, yeah. When you say, when you say um, like fast, what's your, just a bit of context of like, if you're doing like, so I, for me, like a five, five and 10K time, what's, what's like, a, what's fast for, for you uh, on that? Well, I would, it would vary. I wouldn't do many 5Ks, but my 10K, I would always run my 10K under 50 minutes. Um, yeah, so between nice. 45 and 50 minutes, depending on the day. Um, what do you think, what's your, what's your like, PB for 10K? Oh, 45 something. Um, yeah, yeah 45. It's fine. Like, it's not, yeah. there's way faster runners than me. Um, and I'm not a gifted runner by any stretch. Like, yeah. But if you can keep that going... Yes, and, that, and the thing is, those will be in consecutive days. I do a lot of consecutive runs. So I could do, I could do 10 or 20 kilometers five days in a row. So that's, that's how my training yeah. Yeah. Think, yeah. yeah, I'm thinking um, <laughs> on Thursday, we went out for a walk in the Peak District for, for my wife's birthday. And I was sore as anything. Like we were out <laughs> for four and a half, we did like one little peak. We were out for four and a half hours. And like the next day, I'm sore as anything. Like I couldn't even, didn't even want to do like a body weight squat or anything else. And like, I've done a, like I could, I've, I think the furthest, I've done a half marathon, not as an organized event, like just actually just did one. And it just, that, that, that total volume of work just like ruined my body for like, as in, you know, like you're saying your hips, your knees and everything. And like being able to like, I think, I think I've done a 42 minute 10k but i'm like that's dying as yeah but i'm like yeah and i'm done for a week um, yeah the the ability to be able to back those things up i think is very 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 interesting um it, and it's, it's an interesting as you said like um, your bo the thing is it's an adapt adaptation you know this with, with calisthenics like your body adapts like mm. as you one of the things I always tell people is it becomes your new normal, like, and never to jump into what I do or what somebody else does. Like when I'm training for an event, I'm training for it. And my entire week is structured around doing five sessions or six sessions with this amount of speed for this distance. And your body becomes accustomed. You didn't jump there overnight. It's the same as going, right, here's your human flag. It's like, that's not, that no one ever like it, it takes the progression of building up and so it's always worth keeping in mind that when you know just because so, i know there's a couple of ultra runners that are yeah here, always have your baseline as your starting point and then build upon that because the reason you'd be sore after say going fast for 10k well that's a fast 10k is your body hasn't adapted to it either like if i go out and run you know 30 kilometers after not having ran for six weeks, I can't walk for two days. So, yeah. you know, and it's just your, your body will adapt to it, but you have to kind of gradually build as well. Yeah. There was, so there was a question when we were talking about your training, there was a question, um, Trollkin, about what does your uh, leg work, what does your leg training look like as an ultra runner? It's probably two, it sounds like there's potentially two parts because you've got your, what you would just do, as you say, normally, and then do you do anything different for your legs for, I think that's only, questions about like pistol squats. Yeah, the only, I don't do, okay. I don't do pistol squats. I do a lot of unilateral work though. If I'm training for, um, if I'm training for an event or I've got an ultra marathon coming up, I'll do a lot of single leg work. So um, not so much pistol squats, but I'll do work off of one leg so that I'll do um, jumps from one side or off a box on a single leg more yeah. because, Depending on the course, like I'll always reverse my training based on the course. So because the last one was relatively flat, it was in Nevada desert, but it was relatively flat. 
I did a little bit of work on stability just because there'd be rocks and gravel, but it wasn't too bad. Whereas when I did say Marathon de Saab, which was six back-to-back -back marathons, I did massive volume on my legs. Like I was doing 300, 400, 500 rep workouts on squats and lunges, and then I would go run because I had to condition my legs to be able to do multi-day work. So yeah. the, the, the strategy was there. Uh, when I when I was training for the Arctic, I did loads of stuff on lunges. I did so many lunges because when you're running through the ice or running through the snow, you can drop off very fast, and that can lead to injury. So I did a lot of work that required variations of movement patterns that were lunges, overhead, normal, weighted, body weight, the whole lot. Um, so I'll always on the course or based on what I'm training for, I will revert, like, you know, my, my background strength and conditioning coach. Yeah. I'll reverse my strength and conditioning program based on whatever it is that I'm currently training for. So that's kind of what those last three events look like. Yeah. And those, because one of the questions, he, uh, he asked a follow-up question as an ultra runner about pistol squats versus bar squats. But just to, if I paraphrase that based on what he said a little bit or tweak it a little bit of going, is that, um, I like the concept of you being quite specific about the terrain and then like making that applicable and building up like, like, like what I said, like, like backing, backing running sessions up day after day, but, all, but almost using like your lower body work to back to, to allow yourself to do that. So I probably wouldn't at the moment, if, if I've done pistol squats or some shrimp squat or done some lower body work on like Monday, I wouldn't think about backing that up on Tuesday. Cause I'm thinking of more about like, just adaptation, come back when I'm fresher rather than, rather than get, if it was, but it's because I'm not trained for not ultra marathon, but what I'm hearing is that actually you can use some of your lower body training to actually help with what you're trying to achieve from your ultra um, run scenario. Is the, is the work that you're doing, as I said, versus bar squats, is it like quite high volume, high reps, no it weight or? Yeah, it yeah, depends depends on the phase um, it depends on the phase so I right now like prior to lockdown because I was training for Ironman I was doing a lot of overhead squats um, so my whole program was based on overhead squats just because I was trying to keep the range of motion obviously for the swim a lot of different stuff that would have potentially helped um, but it still keeps the conditioning in my legs so I'll change it based on I'll, some of it's by feel if I'm being honest like sometimes I'm like I'm by feel where I'm like I need to do some strength work I felt really weak on these runs all week. I actually need to do some strength yes. work here. Um, or conditioning, like, you know, where I'm like, my legs, where my mind is good, my body's good, but my legs just aren't conditioned enough. Or I'm like, right, I need more high volume work. So I'll listen to my body based on that. And then I'll, I'll tweak my training, whether I'm doing, you know, single leg squats, pistol squats, barbell, front squats, whatever yeah. it is, the rep ranges, the volume, the rest, they will all tweak based on how I'm feeling and based on what I'm trying to do, based on what it is that I'm training for. And then, so if it lunge, say, just take lunge as an example, if you were wanting to do like, if you wanted to classify that as like high volume because you wanted more of that conditioning work, what, how high, what would high, you know, for some people more than 10 reps is high volume, you know. Uh, I would do probably 25 reps. I would do like four sets of 25, which would be like a hundred reps set, um, like hundred reps over four yeah. sets. Yeah, so that would be, for me, would be relatively moderate to high. Like I can go higher than that and I have gone higher than that. Um, but that would be kind of, um, kind of where, where I'd have that sweet spot in terms of what I would consider high volume. Do, um, is there much, much plyometric work done? Um, I know for like when I played rugby, we did a lot, but more for sort of um, sprinting, but just the idea of getting that, that contact time really, really efficient with the ankle, like is that and maybe uh, if, low if, level stuff or not? If, if I wasn't bringing any pre existing injuries or background in, I would do loads of plyometric. Um, but my body can't handle it. Like I've had three knee surgeries, so my body isn't good with plyometrics. Like my knee still flares up if I do box jumps. Um, right. I'll still factor them in, but I, I can't do a day of box jumps, even three or four sets, unless I have deep tissue booked in right. for later in the day, because yeah. my, my knee will just swell. Um, so I don't, even though I recommend it to a lot of people who are in similar boats, but I don't do it myself for you know, pre-existing injuries. Yeah, let's um, last couple of um, whilst we're on the ultras, there's some of those. So, Donald Rogers, how long out from ultras do you start training? Uh, it depends on the ultra, like, depends on the ultra 100%. Like, um, if I was training, for example, for anything 50 miles or under, a couple of few weeks, um, 
and anything that's a hundred miles or over or consecutive days, I would give myself at least three months, um, ideally six, just so that I can ease in, so I don't have to like ramp things up too fast. Cool. Um, and again, comes back to knowing what some of that's going to be based on your training background now. Like that's, I think one of the things with like questions is we ask, we ask like me as the if I was asking you a question. I ask you a question that's very specific to me, and yes. you can only you give like the answer in the context of yourself. And the the, the wider <laughs> thing is, you always say, like, it depends. So what, recommend, yeah. Your, yeah, yeah, your background. You know, someone else might be able to do less than that. Someone might need yeah. more than that. Um, so it comes back around to knowing where we're at ourselves. Um, oh, well, Tony, Ian, is your training for ultras? Um, is it your main aim just to complete? Complete it for self satisfaction or to be genuinely competitive. He was top ten, you right here. Top ten oh, after eighty it's miles. It's a good question. Um, you, completion is normally my goal. Um, and the hundred miler, I I didn't care at all about the the results. It was all about finishing the hundred miles. And ideally, I was trying to do it in the twenty four hours. Um, but that didn't happen. It just didn't go that way. You know, it's the the nature of the beast with an ultra marathon. Uh, it depends. Like the thing is. When I started them, they're all about completion. But as you get better, you, your, your bar moves higher. You know this. Like, you know, when you go from rugby to calisthenics, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm good at these. I, I can get better at this. And then you're like, well, I want to be able to do this move. So as you get more confident and do it more, your goals change. So when I did Marathon to Sob, I was like, I just need to not die. I just need to finish this, you know. Um, but now when I'm looking at the 100 miler, I'm like, right. Like my plan, I have a couple of things. It depends on how COVID goes. But if I do a 100 miler again, I'm like, I want to do it in 24 hours. Now, if that places me in the top five, great. But my goal, I'm never going to work to a place. I'm like, I have no control over a placing. But I can work to... I want to hit it within 24 hours, which is still a goal of mine um, because it just didn't happen on the first go round. So I'll go back and I'll attempt it again. So it, it, it depends. Like at the beginning, that's what it was for self satisfaction. But then as you get better, your bar moves. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I think that depending on trending on mindset and person, I think of um, it was interesting you're saying about like running, you know, when you said about running on a treadmill just being like mind numbingly boring. When I. Like I retired from rugby in 2013 with a head injury and it took me a year to be able to run without getting a headache. Um, and when I could get back to running, I wanted to be able to run, but I was so bad at running at that point. I remember um, my wife was, uh, she used to play football and she was pretty, she's, she's a good runner. And so it was even more depressing. There's nothing worse than just getting beaten by your wife and everything, is there? <laughs> um, so that was, I had that to deal with as well. But um, I remember going on the treadmill. I was never a big fan of treadmills anyway, but I tried to do 5K on the treadmill and I stopped after about 30 seconds because just, I just couldn't deal with it mentally. Um, but when I got to the point of like, I, um, it just makes me think of going to, going to park run, do, my, you do your first park run, you're like, okay, yeah, this is for the next one. I'm like, I'm at the front. I'm like, I'm yeah, like, yeah, I'm, complete. I'm, you're just, the, the, the yells, the, the band over your head. You're like, oh. <laughs> like, if I, regardless of whether, this is a little bit stupid, but this is what I know what I'm like, regardless of whether I've trained for it or not, if I randomly go and turn up at a park run, I'm there for a PB. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's, yeah. But um, there was a question about this, this is, and they were just in uh, some mindset stuff. So there's a question from um, Splonking Woosh. Um, That's a you, great handle. If you hate running, what do you do to distract yourself while you're doing it? I've got, and I've got a question that I want to sort of mix in with this. That um, I put out a post yesterday about, um, I'd, I'd just finished training and I was feeling, I was, I was, I was feeling really good about myself. I was feeling physically feeling good, mentally feeling good. And I was being very uh, grateful, practicing some gratitude of, 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 and just appreciating that. And my mind moved to a place of like, how do I create, how do I create this feeling when I'm not feeling good? Does that make sense? Like my challenge to myself was how do I, when I'm when things in life are not going well and when I'm not feeling happy, how do I still manage to like appreciate and get into that type of of headspace? So it's a it's a mindset question around like when you're not feeling it, where do we go with our mindset to try and and flip that on its head? 
Um, the same with that. So that like that specific example, like you're running and you're not feeling it. Like how do you, how do you, how do you, have you got any tips for people on that? I'm going to give you the answer and then I'm going to dissect it. Cause the answer is you just do it like that. That's, that's the nice. answer. Um, but I am, I am going to dissect that cause it's not as straightforward as that. It's as simple as that, but it's not as easy. It's not as easy as that. Um, yeah. One of the quotes I live by is like one of my mentors used to always tell me that successful people do what they have to do, whether they feel like it or not. I'm like that. That's been tattooed on my brain. And when I think of running, I've never and, and I can say this wholeheartedly, Jacko, I've never had a day that I've looked forward to running ever. Like I, I just don't enjoy it. So that's why I get so much from it, because every day I run, it forces me to do something I don't want to do. So what I do is I talk, I call them like the anchors of self-discipline. So they're in the book. I talk about them on the podcast for free, the whole lot. So I do two things every day that I don't want to do. One is I get up early. I'm not a morning person. Right? We joked earlier. Really? I got, I'm not. I'm, I'm a night owl. By nature, if you just left me to my default, I, like I get up every day at four or five a.m. and I would be closer going to bed at that time. Like if you just if you left me to my own devices, I'm I'm way closer to a night owl. So I force myself to get up. To I'm loving you even more, Brian. I'm loving you huh? even more. I'm loving you even more. I love it. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, 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 the, it's the God's honest truth. And it's the same with running. So I try and anchor my day in both of those things. So it forces me to do things that I don't want to do. So when you get into that habit, it makes everything else so much easier. Like difficult conversations, work tasks, everything is so much easier because you're like, right, I have to do this thing over here. I don't fucking care how I feel. I just have to go do it. And you're conditioning yourself by doing that every day. Like it's like, the analogy I use is like laying brick, you know, when you're building a wall. Like anytime I ever get overwhelmed by a goal, I'm like, well, the Great Wall of China started with a brick on top of another brick, on top of another brick, until there's the Great Wall of China. So it, it's talking about what we did, said earlier, you're breaking things down. And if you're trying to get better at doing things that you know you have to do, you break that down. You do, what can I do today that's going to help me build a little bit of self-discipline so I do the things I have to do, whether I feel like it or not. So to tie it back to the running, for mm. example, what I do on runs is I, I, I do a little bit of mindset tricks on it. So I anchor two things either side of something I hate. I call, it's like a shit sandwich, like um, for the lack of a better term, where I do the thing that I fucking hate in the middle, but I have two things I really like either side of it. So what I do is I do my weight training first because I can get out of bed at 4 or 5 a.m. to weight train. I love weight training, but I'm not getting out at 4 or 5 a.m. to run. Like I, I can't do those two things. And, and never in my whole life have I jumped out of bed to go for a run. I'm like, I don't like doing either of those things. I want to stay in my bed and I don't want to run. But I will get up to weight train. So I'll get up, I do my weight training, and then I normally have my favorite meal, whatever it is I love having, as my post-workout meal, which is the yeah. saddest meal ever. It's like vegetables and salmon and salt. I was going to say, what is it? What's, what's the favorite it, meal? It, it, it's, 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 the, it's the saddest meal. It's literally like mixed vegetables, salmon, and pink Himalayan salt. But like, it's my what favorite. Time, and what time would that be? Uh, I normally eat, it depends on my training day, either eight, nine, or 10. Um, so breakfast, like, that's an interesting Yeah, well, so I don't really have a breakfast per se, because I time, I do all, I eat all, all my food in like a time-restricted window. So I eat everything within an eight, 10 hour window. Um, but yeah, that's what I have. And it's, like salmon's my favorite food. Like, you know, like I love it. Like I eat mostly plants, but like salmon is my staple. It's my favorite food. So that helps me with the run in the middle. And then when I'm actually doing it for the boredom, I save podcasts. Like, you know, I'm subscribed to your podcast. Like, in oh, one, someone, in, someone yeah, like, you listen, uh, you listen to this like, podcast, and it's podcast yeah. on your run. Yeah, but that's it. Like, and, and it's one comes up. Like, if I see a podcast come up, then I'm like, oh, I really like the looks of that. I'll save it. And then I'll save it for my run. So that makes it, it makes me kind of look forward to it. So I have a couple of staple podcasts. Years are in there. Um, Joe Rogan's are in there. Um, a couple of business ones I listen to. And then if I see an episode pop up, I'll just save it. And then I'll keep it for my run. And that makes the actual run not as boring. Um, so that's kind of my process to it um, from kind of top to bottom. But the answer to like doing things that you don't want to do is just do it. But that's it unpacked a little bit. Yeah, nice. Really, really, um, yeah, really helpful, um, helpful advice for people. I'm, you're challenging me on my, um, on, on my alarm get up. <laughs> um, when you say four or five o'clock, those two times are very different to me. Like, uh, yeah. 
and you know what? They're the same because they're both fucking super early. <laughs> like I, when I think of four or five, but how do you decide if it's going to be four or five? Uh, not a combination on how much I slept the night before and what I have to do the following day. So if if I have a super long run, and I say for example, if I'm writing, you know, like I'm writing the, the new book at the minute, so I write in the morning block. So when the gyms are open, the gym doesn't open till six. Right. So I would drive to the gym and then I have an hour, an hour and a bit to write, and I would just right. write in my car or I would do my emails or I would do my messages or whatever it was before uh -huh. the gym. Um, so it depends on how much I have, like if I have, because I batch my podcasts as well. So when I'm recording podcasts, I try and do several in a day. So yeah. if I've got one of those days, but I'm like, right, I need to write in the morning or I need to get my emails done or I need to reply to my messages, I'll get up at four so that I can do that. Um, yeah. And that's normally how I'll make the decision on it. But five is like my staple. Um, like Monday to Friday, five is the time I get up. Um, and then four based on... Uh, <laughs> Exactly, yeah. Or if I have a super long workout. Like if I have a three hour long workout scheduled because I'm close to an event, I get up at four. Because like, it's I, you know, same as everybody. Like I've got my daughter, I've got my family, I've got my friends, I've got my business. I'm like, I don't want to be spending at least by nine o'clock. I've got most of my day out of the way because I've been yeah. up for five hours, you know? So when everybody else is getting up and about, it, you know, it, it's perfect. So I can meet my mum for lunch. I can bring Holly to the playground. I can do all these other things. So yeah. my doing that is just getting up earlier so that it's done and then I can kind of do all the other things that I want to do in my life. Not yeah. the things that I don't want to do in the morning, but they're they're done then and I can kind of prioritize in other areas of my life. There's probably a better wording for that. Yeah, cool. No, I like it. Um, we're, we're, st we're starting to run out of time. I could talk to you all day, Brian, but I've got a couple of other little things uh, to finish on. Did want to ask, and someone's asked a question about, uh, it's a little bit more of a body comp question, which I know you obviously help a lot of people with, um, yourself with um with your stuff so uh but the question so from rowan perry was um he really enjoys cardio but doesn't want to lose too much muscle any advice and i'd yeah. actually say that there's there's a little bit of mindset in there around like we talk about um and this is a body composition question is probably way bigger than this but um we talk about being more trying to get into a mindset place just because it's a, it's a positive way to look at ourselves of being more interested in what we can do with our body than getting obsessed with how it looks. I imagine when uh, you would do it, when you've done fitness modeling, that that getting rated on how you look plays probably tricks with your mind. But, um, so bad. Advice, uh, I bet you feel like a poodle on stage. Like, have you ever seen any of those dog shows? I'm like, <laughs> like, that's how you feel. I'm like, oh, jump, lassie, jump, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's not the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I mean, so uh, Rowan Perry, it was about like, um, well, I'd be, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on your thoughts on that, like getting like getting into a place where you're obsessing about how you look, even though you wanted to change your body comp, and then also like his his specific one of um, not trying to lose too much muscle when he's doing his running, even though he enjoys running. If you enjoy running. I would say do some running. Yeah, I completely agree. Well, I'm going to approach that slightly from two angles, Jacko, because because there is the answer. There's the actual answer that he probably wants, and then there's the mindset side which you asked on. Yeah. Mindset side, I always think of body composition, and it's funny because we've talked about ultra endurance here. I don't prep anybody for ultra endurance. All my people I work with are yeah. body because that's my area of expertise. I'm like endurance is just something I do over here because I have time and I like doing it, you know, in, in terms of challenging myself. Body composition is, you know, sports nutrition is my background, nutritionist, personal trainer, etc. So what I generally tell people when it comes to obsessing on body, and I love your message on this, it's very similar to mine, is I, I'm all about getting to great shape. But don't think that all your happiness and confidence is yeah. in the, this end. You know, that's the, the thing. And that's the thing, you know, I call it in my book, the, the I'll be happy win fallacy. You know, I'll be happy when I hit this weight. I'll be happy when I build this muscle. I'll be happy when I do this thing. And I think it's really important to identify and understand that ooh, that's not where it comes from. So if that's where you're at and you're like, well, when I look this way, I'm going to feel this thing. I'm like, that might not happen. So just be mindful of that in the front end. Now, we can unpick that. That's a whole other podcast. So yeah. I won't spend time on it. But the actual answer in terms of the, the physiology and the, 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 the response of, if you enjoy running, as Jacko said, run. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't be a bigger believer in doing something that you enjoy, especially in physical fitness, purely because it's what you're going to be able to stick to. Is it better than swimming? 
I don't know. But if you enjoy running, you should run. Like, yeah, if you, if you enjoy it, if you don't enjoy spinning, it's better than spinning. <laughs> it, it's, couldn't agree, but like perfect. Like that's exactly it. But when it comes in to say, what was the question? Maintaining muscle? Uh, yeah, it doesn't want to lose too much muscle mass. Yeah. So, well, two things there. One is there's a massive amount of, um, it, it's going to be your nutrition that's going to determine that. Like one of the things that surprises people, I'll use myself because I'm a good example in this scenario, is when I don't lose any size running 100 miles a week, people are like, how the fuck haven't you shrank? I'm like, well, a couple of things. One, I I'm not, I'm, not built to be skinny like i couldn't be skinny even if i ran 600 miles a week <laughs> but it do it it just doesn't shrink little hobbit builds so that's one so there's a genetic component and a, a muscle memory component but two my nutrition goes up as in I, my calories go way up if i'm running 100 miles a week on top of my training i'll double my calories like i could be eating 5,000 calories a day like eat comfortably and so that will go up so you don't lose that size so it's a nutritional thing and people will say, look, I'm thinking of running 20 miles a week. Will I lose all my size? I'm like, well, not if you lose your, not if you dial in your nutrition. I'm like, that's not a massive amount of mileage. I'm like, you could run a marathon every single week and not lose any muscle if your nutrition was in alignment with that output. Like it's calories in, calories out. So you need calories back in, but provided you do that, you'll have no problem. Uh, but what I'd also say there is like, um, what I do in my training, and this might be helpful for the person that asked the question, is a M M MED on resistance training, which is a minimum effective dose for size. Yeah. So you don't actually have to do that much, whether it's hypertrophy, body weight calisthenics, if you've got good genetics for that, um, or CrossFit style workouts, whatever it is you're doing, a minimum effective dose on weight training, resistance training in some form, is going to preserve all that muscle you have. Again, context is key. There's genetic components. Some people are going to lose weight faster. Some people are going to gain weight faster. There's lots of other things there, but that's the actual answer. Um, but as Jacko, as you said, the mindset side is such a big key as well to not think that I'll be happy when I look a certain way because that's not the case in a lot of instances with people. Yeah, I think you'll be happy when you eat, when we start uh, accepting ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's it. Like, it goes a bit back to that question that, um, or that thing that I mentioned around going like, how can I be, how can, it's almost like, how can I be happy when I'm sad? Yeah. In a weird way. Like that's where, it's, which I think is, that's then the question of like contentment. That's a, a whole nother, we'll go, we'll go in, we'll go miles off. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, that's, uh, I like that. Yeah, I like that approach. I think that there's some, some stuff around feeling good because like you know when we look good it does help us feel good but it just needs to be understood in that context of like what's actually good for you for you mentally if you're that's what i was going to say if you're stressing like literally stressing getting stressed about worrying about losing muscle when you're running that's probably going to be the thing that will make you lose muscle more so than the actual yeah. running yeah. if you like you say if you've got your nutrition on um, if you give your body the, when you're talking about um, minimum effective dose, if we give the body a reason to maintain that muscle mass like that small amount of stimulation, it's much more, it's likely to want to, to keep it. I'm going to add one more point there as well that comes up a lot in my channels which might be helpful because you made a great point. Muscle maintenance is not the same as muscle building. Yeah. So maintaining muscle is significantly easier with an increase in running or training volume than building muscle is. Like, if you're trying to run a marathon and you're trying to build muscle, it's not that you can't do both. It's just that those goals are pulling from opposite sides. You can, it's just harder. Whereas m maintaining muscle and running for a marathon or an ultra marathon isn't super difficult because you can adjust things. So not to confuse the two as well, because muscle maintenance and what you have versus muscle building are two different things. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. All right, Brian, we're going uh, to wrap it up. Uh, there we've gone we're supposed to be we're supposed to be 30 minutes to 45 minutes we're up to 55 yeah uh, yeah i was like the oh, next guest funny. yeah no, the next, yeah. The next apologies guest, that's uh, totally my fault <laughs> the next guest uh ollie uh ollie frost is up with uh tim in literally four minutes time so we're gonna jump off but um thank you so much for coming on um you've gained one new someone has said written i'm gonna have to follow brian now so you've got yes. one new follower it was I'll, fuck, I'll take it welcome to my page if you don't follow if you if you're signing in for the first time and this is your first experience of brian where have you been 
Um, and to go out, make sure you do go over and give him a follow. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for watching. Keep up. We've got another 11 amazing guests coming up uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, Brian, we need to get you on to the podcast again because I think there's a load more stuff that we get that we can talk to, uh, we'll, uh, to we'll talk double. about. We'll back on mine as well. We'll, we'll double it over. Yeah. So get... yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about. And I will let I'll get I'll personally get in touch with you about sorting out your human flag journey. Yeah, love it, love it, Jacko. Thank you so much again, sure. man. Have a killer day and enjoy. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Nice, brother. See you. Bye.